The following program is pre-recorded. It takes us just past the top of the hour here at KPFA. My name is Brian Edwards Teekert. Normally I'm on the air in the mornings at 7 a.m., but during fun drives, we tend to mix things up a little bit and bring you some of our favorite work from other parts of the broadcast schedule to the time you're listening now. Uh, and this hour, it's our very great favorite, our very great pleasure, excuse me, to bring you longtime friend of the station, Dr. Gabor Mate. Here's the interview from KPFA's Upfront. You're listening to Upfront. I'm Brian Edwards Teekert. One of the things that has struck me about the past year or so of the pandemic has been the chorus of generally well off people calling for an urgent return to normal. And this strikes me because normal was not that great. Before COVID, we were a society with spiraling inequality, shrinking life expectancies, a fraying safety net, an exploding housing crisis, and epidemic levels of chronic disease. And for a brief moment, the urgency of the pandemic seemed to promise a, a reprieve. There was this uniting sense of purpose and social solidarity in the realm of Politics, suddenly our leaders discovered the capacity to see to the needs of the vulnerable. There was this kind of collective shrugging off of some of the stresses we'd come to accept in day-to-day -day life. Now for our next guest, normal was part of the problem. Gabor Mate is a physician well-known for his work on addiction, on attention deficit disorder, and on the psychosocial dimensions of disease. His new book, co-authored with his son Daniel, is The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Dr. Mate, welcome back to KPFA. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I wanted to start the, the kind of foundational concept in your work is, is your theory about the effects on human health of trauma. So perhaps we could start there with a, a working definition. When you talk about trauma, what do you mean? Well, first of all, let me say that from the scientific point of view, uh, trauma has been linked to all manner of uh, illness, whether of the mind or the body. For example, um, uh, Harvard study three years ago, the more PTSD symptoms a woman has, the greater her risk for ovarian cancer. Uh, men sexually abused in childhood have tripled the rate of heart attacks. Uh, people traumatized in childhood have increased rates of multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, not to mention addictions, not to mention depression, anxiety, psychosis, and so on. So we're talking about a well-established uh, connection largely ignored by the medical profession. Now, then we have to ask, as you just have, what is trauma? So the simplest way to express it is that trauma originates from the word in ancient Greek for wound. So trauma is a wound that we've sustained. And so trauma is a wound that we've sustained for any number of reasons, but trauma is not what happened to us. So trauma can be induced by childhood adversity, just as sexual or emotional or physical abuse, by neglect, by violence in a family, by addiction in the family, by a parent dying, by a parent being jailed, but trauma can also be induced simply by a child's needs not being met. So, the child, but trauma is not these events. Trauma is the wound that we then sustain as a result. And the biggest impact of trauma is that when we're having painful experiences, either because we're being hurt or because our needs are denied, as children, we're unable to sustain the pain so we disconnect from ourselves in order not to feel it. And that disconnection from the self, from the body and from emotions, in our essence, is the deepest impact of trauma. So trauma then is a long-term wound that cuts us off from ourselves, fundamentally from other people. It changes our view of the world. It creates shame in the individual. As children always think, if things go badly, it's their own fault. There's something wrong with them. And then it induces patterns of being that then promote illness later on in life. Why do you think the medical profession has the, the blind spot that you described around trauma? Well, it's interesting because, you know, back in, as far as back in 1939, <clears throat> there was a very famous physician at Harvard who to this day is honored by an annual day named after him. And he said in 1939, 
And this lecture was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that emotional and psychological factors are at least as important in the causation of illness as physical factors and must be at least as important in the healing. And there have been this recognition of the connection between the mind and body and therefore of traumatic events for a long time on the part of leading physicians, pioneering physicians, but it's like the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, these uh, sentiments, these insights, and all the scientific research that has documented it voluminously since then has drops without a trace to the bottom of the ocean. And the average medical student to this day does not hear a single lecture on trauma, which is astonishing given the actual science. And I think that has a number of um, causes in the background. First of all, we live in a society that separates mind from the body and the medical ideology, which is, we like to think of medicine as a science, which partly it gloriously is, but it's also significant in ideology. And ideology has its blind spots. And one of the blind spots of Western ideology, particularly under capitalism, is the separation of mind from the body. So the medical profession sort of reflects the dominant perspective. Secondly, although the research gets published, most of the research that's presented to physicians is the research that's funded by those who profit from the research, which is to say the pharmaceutical companies. The pharmaceutical companies have no stake in teaching physicians about trauma because there's no pills for it. There's pills for the effects of it. And if, in fact, most pharmacology is to design to beneficially or otherwise reduce the symptoms of trauma, but not to get at the cause itself. So that's the second point. The third point is that physicians themselves are a, light, a very traumatized group. Medical training is, for a lot of people, very brutal, very difficult. It's demeaning. Um, it's it's um, shame-inducing. And uh, it's, you know, you don't sleep. You're deprived of sleep. You're subjected to authority and leaders. Um, you are... Um, ridiculed if you fail sometimes or if you don't show up like they want you to show up. You're discouraged from actually being vulnerable and having your emotions show. All of this trains a certain cohort in ignoring their own trauma. And not to mention who goes into medicine in the first place. Well, I can tell you from personal experience, I was a driven, I was a very driven person. I really wanted to be a doctor for all kinds of reasons. I was willing to ignore my own needs quite extensively in order to get into and get through medical education and medical practice. So all these factors combine to make trauma a kind of um, strange subject for doctors to consider. The example you used to illustrate the concept um, of, of trauma's impacts on health was a sexual assault. But, but you also write early in the introduction about what you describe as a, a small T trauma, a, a more quotidian form of trauma. What, what is a small T trauma? Yeah, so we have to make a distinction between <clears throat> type of events that induce trauma. But again, let's keep in mind that trauma is not what happens to you. Trauma is what happens inside your result. So it's a wound, and you can be wounded in two ways. One is, is if bad things happen that shouldn't have, such as the death of a parent, violence in the family, sexual abuse, emotional, physical abuse, children being spanked. These are all documentably traumatic events. But you can also hurt children just by not needing their needs. So the human child, like any infant of any mammalian species, is born with certain needs. And those needs include unconditional loving acceptance, non-stressed parents who can be emotionally attuned to the child, but the child doesn't have to work to make the relationship work. They don't need to be good or smart or pretty or successful. They can just be and not have to please the parents in order to have their acceptance celebrated and their existence welcomed. Children have a need to experience all their emotions from joy to rage, from grief to, to, to fear and have that understood and accepted by the parents. And it shouldn't have a need for spontaneous free play out in nature. These are 
evolutionarily determined needs of the human child. And in our society, those needs are less and less met, not because parents don't love their kids or do their best, but because they're so stressed and they're so isolated and they're under such pressure. You know, now if you factor in economic uncertainty, uh, the parents' own trauma that they haven't dealt with yet because nobody helped them to deal with it, if you factor in the many marriages that end in rancor and divorce, if you factor in um, the fact that in the United States particularly, 25% of women have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth, which amounts to a collective abandonment of the infant, because the infant needs that mom for at least nine months, and I should say several years. Uh, if you factor in um, what I've referred to before is the erosion of community, we evolved as communal creatures. We lived for millions and hundreds of thousands of years as communal creatures. Looking at human beings today and trying to understand them is like trying to understand a zebra in a zoo rather than its natural environment. So when these needs are not met, children can also be wounded. And that is a potent source of illness, both physical and mental. So I think as, as a society, we have kind of a, a vague grasp on how a single traumatic event like a combat incident or an assault um, can create long lasting effects, a post-traumatic stress disorder that can be yeah. triggered by similar stimuli. I, I don't think it's easy to get an idea of how those small T traumas, not having your needs met early in life, um, produce longer range effects. What do those look like? Well, so by the way, when it comes to adult PTSD, say combat induced, the research is very clear that the people who are most prone to fall subject to that are the ones who were traumatized already in childhood. So that the adult experience simply is a triggering of childhood trauma. That's just very clear. But to answer your question, let's say we have a child whose uh, mother is depressed, okay, which is very frequent in our society, postpartum depression. That mom will not be able to attune to the child's emotions, not because she doesn't want to, but because her own brain makes it impossible for her to do so. That lack of attunement makes the child feel like she or he is not seen and accepted. That means the child will not, not have to work to get the love and the acceptance. Now that pattern of working to get love and acceptance by suppressing your own emotions will then translate into a lifelong pattern of trying to please others, placate them, be the good person, be the helpful person, which imposes a lot of stress on the individual, which stress is a potent contributor to autoimmune disease and malignancy. So it, it, it's these adaptations that children have to make. There's an, there's an article from Harvard pointed out about 10 years ago that these adaptations that children make to the environment are necessary in the short term, but they become source of pathology later on. Or, for example, let's take a loving, well-meaning parent who listens to the advice of any number of parenting experts who tell her or tell him or tell them that an angry child should be given a timeout. In other words, you take a two-year-old who throws a tantrum, you separate from them, and you say, now you have to sit by yourself. Now, the child has a huge need, in fact, there's an, uh, uh, an overarching need to attach, to belong, to connect with the parent. When the child gets the message that if I'm angry, I'm going to be rejected, even temporarily, the child will naturally repress her anger in order to be accepted by the parents. Now, the repression of anger is a common theme in chronic illness, in people who get chronic illness, as I've shown in one of my previous books, and as other studies have shown, it increases the risk of breast cancer, prostate cancer, and autoimmune disease, um, and so on. So that these well-meaning parental practices, or for example, so many parents these days are taught to sleep train their kids. Now that's so that the parent can deal with the stresses of this highly stressed society, but the child. Now you tell the mother baboon to ignore the child's cries. You tell the mother rat 
to ignore the child's desperate vocalizations. And you'll find out what maternal instinct is all about or parenting instinct is all about. But, but human parents are told to ignore their instincts all the time in order to socialize the kids into this society. That's deeply hurtful. What kind of adaptive response does that cause in the children? Well, they repress their emotions. They repress their healthy anger. Now, healthy anger is not... Uh, I'm talking about healthy anger here. There's all kinds of unhealthy anger. But healthy anger is simply a boundary defense. If I were to intrude on your emotional boundaries, even as we talk to each other across the air, your healthy response would be to say, you're in my space, stop it, get out. That's healthy anger. That's a boundary defense. It, when we repress our boundary defenses, people are going to be crossing our boundaries all the time, which is stressful for the organism. Stress causes disease. And that's why the repression of healthy anger is such a documented um, uh, factor in, in the lives of people who tend to get ill. Now, by the way, science has also shown that the emotional system of our brains and our bodies is inseparable from the hormonal apparatus and the immune system and the nervous system. In fact, these are not separate systems. It's all one system, you know. Now, the role of the immune system is also to protect your boundaries. So emotions are there to let in and let us know what is healthy and nurturing and to welcome it and to keep out what is dangerous and toxic. The immune system has exactly the same function. Given that unity of the immune system with the emotional system, the scientifically documented unity, when you suppress healthy anger, you're also messing with your immune boundaries. And that same immune system can turn against you just as the suppressed anger can turn against you. So it's really very simple. The example you draw from uh, during your own life is, is in, enduring the Holocaust as a Jew in Hungary, um, you know, at an age where most of us aren't really laying down memories. Um, what, what happened to you? How, how does that impact you? Well, so the first chapter of the book, the chapter on trauma, opens with uh, your author, namely me, arriving home from a speaking trip at the age of 71 from Philadelphia to Vancouver and uh, expecting my wife of then mm, close to 50 years to pick me up at the airport. When I land, and I'm feeling really good because the trip went well, and Air Canada bumped me up to first class for some reason, so I had a really good <laughs> trip home. And I'm feeling pretty good about myself when I get a text on landing from my wife, Ray, saying, I haven't left home yet. Do you still want me to come? And I go into a sullen rage, and I text back saying, never mind, and I take a taxi home. Imagine the outrage of having to take a taxi home at the age of 71 and getting home, and I'm not even looking at my spouse. I'm barely grunting at her, and I keep this up for 24 hours. Until she finally says, well, knock it off already. Now, in the present, nothing happened. All that happened was that my wife being an artist, and I've only known this for half a century, when she's in the studio, she forgets about everything. She's in that flow of creation, and uh, that's what happened. However, when I was a year old, my mother gave me to a complete stranger in the streets of Budapest to save my life. And I didn't see her for five or six weeks. Now, as an infant, I could only experience that as an abandonment. I didn't know about Nazis or Hitler or genocide or war. All I had, this was the traumatic event, this quote-unquote abandonment by my mother. The wound was that I came to believe that I was being rejected and I was unlovable. So even an incident that vaguely resembles, very vaguely resembles the original injury will trigger that emotional memory of abandonment. And then I react like a one-year-old child. When I saw my mother after those five or six weeks, I didn't look at her for several days. And that's what I do with my wife. And this is how trauma, Peter Levine, psychologist, calls it the tyranny of the past. So people under the impact of trauma live under the tyranny of the past. And until we work it through, the past keeps dominating our current reactions. 
The voice of Dr. Gabor Mate. He's just published a book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. It's a book capping more than four decades of working on the front lines between society and disease. And we're going to be continuing our conversation with him about it in just a few minutes. Uh, before we do, I, I need to break in with a, a, a small piece of news on the fundraising front. We have just received what is a very large challenge. Uh, Bill in Occidental and Myra in Berkeley have offered to double $1,000 for KPFA if we can raise 1000 to match them by the end of the hour. The end of the hour is 38 minutes from now, and we're going to spend most of those 38 minutes bringing you more of the interview with Gabor Mate. So we're asking you to put the next 90 seconds to good use and pledge whatever you can at kpfa.org or 1-800-439-5732. If you've been interested in the conversation, uh, you can pick up a copy of this book. It's in the featured box at kpfa.org, or you can ask for it over the phone at 1-800-439-5732. The Myth of Normal Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. It talks about health and capitalism, trauma, and adaptation, treating disease as a teacher and, and using it to follow a trail of clues that helps us learn more about our lives and our social context. The thin line between passion and addiction, how to heal not just as people, but as a society. He goes through this theory of trauma that has really revolutionized a lot of areas of care and, and some areas of policy in the past few years. He draws extensively both from his experience as a hands-on practitioner, as, as an early person in the harm reduction movement, risking his own medical license to set up safe use facilities in Vancouver, Canada, and his model of what he calls bio-social, so, excuse me, biopsychosocial medicine, looking at society, culture, the environment when we diagnose and treat disease. Um, he also draws a lot of his insights into the human condition uh, from his deep work with Buddhism. He is just a, a deeply reflective person, a, a joy to talk to, someone who is so committed to healing and sees that as anything other than the kind of individual mechanistic pursuit that Western medicine is set up to treat it as. Uh, Gabor Mate's book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture, is a pledge of $15 a month or 150 all at once, which means if we could convince seven people to pledge for the book by the end of the hour, we will make that $1,000 challenge. We're going to start the $1,000 countdown now. KPFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. If you need a mnemonic device to remember that number, it is 1-800-HEY-KPFA. And it's going to be whew, more than 20 minutes before I have a chance to tell you whether we've made any progress towards that challenge. So uh, please pledge quickly and pledge generously. KPFA.org. Let's go back to the conversation with Gabor Mate. In your work with the addiction in Vancouver, you were a very early supporter of something that's only now starting to penetrate a few cities in the United States, safe injection sites. Um, yes. Trying to make the, the process of basic personal maintenance uh, not being a, a re-traumatizing event. Yes. So I was the physician at North America's first and for a long time only supervised injection site, which is called Insight, I-N-S-I-T-E here in Vancouver. And attached to it is a place called Onsite, where I was, which is a detox facility where I was the physician. Um, now there are more injection sites in Canada uh, after the Canadian government under the conservative um, regime took it to the Supreme Court trying to shut us down. Um, but they failed. We have a Supreme Court far more rational than yours at the moment. Um, so there's more injection sites across Canada now. And they're beginning to open with great difficulty and in the face of a lot of suspicion and resistance in various cities in the United States as well. And the simple 
understanding is that people who are in the throes of addiction, first of all, have suffered so much already because they're all driven to addiction by severe trauma, number one. Number two, they continue to be traumatized by social narcissism, the utterly irrational and insane drug laws, and uh, by um, exclusion and poverty and so on, and by the lack of empathetic understanding of their problem on the part of the healthcare givers themselves. So these silver injection sites are places where people can bring their illicit drugs and without fear of being arrested, uh, can inject, given sterile water, so they don't have to share needles with each other. They get given clean needles, all of which prevents the spread of HIV and uh, hepatitis C and other infectious diseases. And it gives the users a point of humane contact with people that don't judge them and accept them for who they are. And that acceptance for who you are is just the deepest need of a human being. And so harm reduction in this context means not only reducing the harm of the addiction on the individual, but also reducing the harm of the social barbarism that is inflicted on on drug addicts. I think that's something we've probably uh, under-discussed here in, in our own policy discussions around safe use sites. Uh, the the case for, you know, diminishing the spread of hepatitis C or HIV and, and reducing the rate of overdoses is pretty clear cut. But I'm curious what types of changes you saw in people you worked with when they had a safer context, a, a less re-traumatizing context in which to use drugs. Well, so um, the, I mentioned earlier that trauma shapes your view of the world. Now, these people are often highly traumatized in early childhood. They're, they're the very famous adverse childhood experiences studies actually done in California, which point out that the more childhood adversity there is, the greater the risk of addiction. Also autoimmune disease, also mental illness and all that. But these adverse childhood experiences, which I've already mentioned, include physical, sexual, emotional abuse, and and all those other things that I talked about earlier. Now, when those things happen to you, you don't trust caregivers because the early caregivers that were meant by nature to nurture you and protect you did not protect you or sometimes themselves because of their own trauma perpetrated their trauma upon you. So you, you grow up not trusting caregivers. Then you have the healthcare system that ostracizes and judges drug addicts, even less reason for trust. So if that means that when people have medical needs, they don't come in for treatment because they don't trust the caregivers because their history has been so daunting. No, you establish a, a safe injection site where you treat people like human beings, not only over time do they begin to trust you and they come in and they use in a safer fashion. But they may also come in to have their HIV uh, viral load measured and their medications administered and monitored and adjusted to have their abscesses treated, to have their depression addressed. So in other words, the trust that you establish through these sites, if they're run properly, extends way beyond the question of the spread of infection. Does it make it more possible for people who use drugs to quit them? Is it possible? Well, we know that it is. I mean, a lot of people have done it. But the question is, what are the conditions? I mean, in general, whether we talk about mental illness or physical illness or addiction, the question we have to ask is not is healing possible because it always, well, healing in a broad sense is generally possible. But the question is, what conditions promote healing? So if you talk specifically about addiction, yeah, healing is possible, difficult, but possible, given the right conditions. And we tend to think that it's the condition of addiction that is so hard to heal. But everything happens in a context. Addiction is hard to heal in a context that doesn't deal with the underlying dynamics of trauma that caused it in the first place. So given 
compassion, given safety, given human contact, given support.